Welcome back, family. This week's guest is more than just a visitor to the block. She's family, and we absolutely love her. Make It Last Forever is one of the greatest songs in R&B history, and it featured one of the most iconic female vocals of all time. Jackie McGee sung her heart out, but her story doesn't end there. Her level of involvement in the new Jack Swing era will surprise you, and her spirit will uplift you. And we're happy and honored to bring to you one of the unsung voices of her generation. So let's get to it. Here it is. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you try and make it, it through the it best is. you can. You gotta make it work, right? Mm-hmm. Ah. All right. Make it work. So let me ask, uh, let's start off first. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I feel like it's always best to start off polite. <laughs> I know, and then get into the dirty, dirty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I promise you, we're no, not no, going to get any. Who you had to punch in the face? <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I ask that question, then you can punch me in the face. So we'll start. I guess let's start at the beginning. Thank you. Tell me a little okay. bit about yourself. Um, where'd you come from? And how'd you get into the industry? I'm from. The Bronx. I'm from the Bronx, okay. here, and I moved down south when I was um, I was in the third grade when I moved down south. Okay. And um, I went to school down there. I finished school down there, you know, in South Carolina and Virginia. I graduated high school in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And then I had um, two scholarships to go to college, and for music, one for voice and the other one for playing because I played um, clarinet. I was in marching band and all that. Okay. So I wanted to come back to New York and try my luck with, you know, being a singer. Mm -hmm. So I told my grandfather I wasn't going to take my scholarships and I wanted to try my luck because my brother-in-law was already in the music industry. So from like age 12 and 13, about 12, 13, mm-hmm. I was already ra- around Johnny Kemp and Allison Williams and, and Tume, um, Atlantic Star, mm-hmm. because my um, brother-in-law played for M2. He used to be a member of Change, and then he played for M2 May, and he played for Atlantic Star. So I used to go everywhere, you know, with him when I would come up. He would take me out on some road gigs or whatever, just so I can get the experience. Mm-hmm. But when I came back to New York, I was 18. I um, suffered, you know, a little bit because I was doing stuff with my brother-in-law. Mm-hmm. I was doing Johnny Kent. Um, Johnny had started molding me, too, from when I was, like, 13. And then when I was 18... In the thing, I was singing with Johnny in a band and my brother-in-law and, and, you know, some other musicians. Just, you know, the New York, the little New York thing. Mm-hmm. And I was the shy girl that wanted to sing, scared, to do, you know, that thing. And then I, um, I met Teddy. I met Teddy Riley. And this is before he was Teddy Riley. <laughs> <laughs> it was, he had a, I, I'm trying to think that he even had the little album, the, the Kids at Work album wasn't even out then. Yeah, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and we put a band together called The Project and we started doing local gigs. We used to rehearse on 145th Street, 8th Avenue, um, a spot where Gene Griffin had you know, stuff on lockdown. <laughs> so, that's when we rehearsed. And then we, you know, we did it for a while. We did local gigs and stuff for a while, and then we dispersed. Like, everybody went about their little way. Um, on my channel was singing with us, too. That's the one that did um, Joy and Pain on Rob Bass song. And uh, he's actually, he was, he, was, he passed away last year, God rest his soul. Um, he... He and Teddy's sister had a baby mm-hmm. together. So, you know, we were all like family. Mm-hmm. And um, after we all went our separate ways with the band, then maybe, I would say not, probably a year later, um, 
I was singing, doing the local gig, and my um, father-in-law now, he, he used to be in his band, mm-hmm. and, and Jamila, and uh, he's what Keith by gig I did, and Keith was trying to get me to come to the studio. Mm-hmm. He kept saying, you know, I really want you to come to the studio, I really want you to come to the studio. Kept calling me. I wouldn't go. And finally, one day, like after a month, I was like, okay, I'll come. I went to the studio, see what he was working on. Teddy was there. I didn't know he knew Teddy. <laughs> so it, from that, it was like, it, you know, I look at everything like everything was destined to happen anyway, of, of course, because if it wasn't, I wouldn't have been in, you know, around music people since, you know, me being 12 right. and the way everything happened and you knowing him to me and he's like uncle and to me and you know was being you know what i'm saying and and i know i was destined for it and um once i saw teddy in the studio with keith it was like okay i can do this now i can do this so we started from like background you know session work how big a jump was it for you did you really have to change your approach to, to what you were doing, or it was just like, okay, time was already ready for this anyway? Well, for me, I was already, like I said, I felt like I was destined anyway. Mm-hmm. So I was always, I was always ready. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing I didn't, I wasn't ready for, I wasn't ready for the big deal that I did, you know, because you know, black people don't be teaching their children how to manage. <laughs> 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 and I did pretty good. I did pretty good, but I still, you know, I could have made some investments and and did right by my money. You know, way way better than what I did. But um, I was ready, and I actually started doing artist development on artists when I was an artist because I was always cool. But it, the the crazy part is after I did Make It Last Forever and I did my deal and I did my album, I was finished and they put my album on hold. So when they put my album on hold, I ended up doing a song with Salt and Pepper. Um, I did Expressions, Express Yourself. And that went really big, you know, but people didn't know that I did it. Right. They were like, they didn't put two and two together like, that's Jack and Mickey from Make It Last Forever that did Express Yourself with Salt and Pepper. And that was a, that was a, a double platinum single. Right, right. And, and that was a, that was the biggest song a rap group had with a, a R&B singer. And I think it might have been the first that, you know, that was that big. Um, but, you know, I was doing stuff in between, waiting for my record to drop. And after I did Salt and Pepper, I went out on the road with Toto. T-O-T-O, not Total. Because <laughs> people be like, Total? You went out with Toto? <laughs> and I went out with Toto, uh, the rock group from the 80s. Right. <laughs> I went out with them. Um, and that was a phenomenal experience for me. Mm. You know, that was that's where I got my little rock side and and learn the business. But go ahead, you can ask, I'm sorry. You know, how do how do they respond to the songs? Are they more responsive? Are they more into it? Um to me it's about probably about the same. Mm-hmm. Um but I was in Europe a lot when I was with Toto and the difference between the, the European uh, the European audience and the state, the the American audience, the American audience, especially you know our people, we gotta sing every lyric. We gotta, <laughs> you know, we are gonna be screaming, singing, pookie. You know, we gonna do all that. A lot of times in Europe, they'll wait, you know, to do all the extra clapping and singing. Like they'll they'll do the clapping and screaming at the beginning and then. They'll stop while you're performing. It's like a respect thing. Okay. And then at the end, they go crazy. 
you know, like they really, it's like a respect thing. But now, <laughs> remember, that's a different, different audience you got. That's your, um, your rock audience compared to your R&B audience. <laughs> it's a big difference. Even traveling, you know, with them, totally different. When I was out with Toto, we had a staff that traveled with us, that cooked. We had, you know, we flew business class, first class everywhere. We flew on private jets. You know what I'm saying? It was like a whole different life. With R&B, you know, black people want you to share a room. <laughs> they want nine people in the room. And, um, you know, when you first go out, you go to the little ugly hotels, sitting up there checking the shower curtain, makes it like, ew, there's a nasty shower curtain. <laughs> checking the bed, checking all kinds of stuff. But no, we, we, um, it's, it's a big difference, but nothing is like having people period scream for you, you know, and applaud what you do. So did you enjoy doing background? Um, see, I never considered myself a background singer because okay. When I sung with Keith, I wasn't, I sung background, but I didn't sing background because I didn't make it last forever, plus I did Don't Stop Your Love. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I sung a lot on the first record. Okay. And I went out with Keith twice on the tour. Um, and then I had to stop because I was doing my own stuff and doing Toto. And, of course, Toto paid me more. So I was like, bye, Keith. <laughs> <And>, um, <laughs> Got to like, get that check. <laughs> That's right. Shoot. I think $3,000 a week compared to somebody giving you, you know, 1500 See you. Do <laughs> and, and you flying first class. He was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's sad. But you will kick somebody to the curb in a minute for your coin. But um, it it was like, I don't know. Like I said, for me, even with Toto, I was a background singer with Toto, but I was still singing lead. I was doing, I was doing Georgie Porgy. Um, I was doing, I did a, a, um, a song with them called Angel's Eyes that they have, and that's it's just me singing and, you know, with the band and whatever. And then, um, you know, we did. We had a two-hour show mm-hmm. with Toto, but I just never considered myself like a background singer because I always did, you know, the standout stuff. And then I had my own record, and you know, once my record came out, I had to do my stuff. And then after I finished my second album, MCA dropped me. I got caught up in the politics again, and I got dropped. Um, I was a million dollars in the hole, and they, um, since I was pregnant, you know, I had to pull the, the, the white people card. And I was like, oh, I'm under distress. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so they wiped my slate clean. I didn't owe them no million dollars, so if I went to another record label, I didn't have to, you know, get them a percentage or nothing. Uh-huh. And, you know, they also gave me, like, $20,000. So it was a blessing. But, um... I, I left, once I left them, I was off for maybe like a year after that. And then um, I did a record with the Family Stand. Uh, uh, I did an album with the Family Stand. So, you know, after that, it was like, it was like I started getting getting real, like, I was very frustrated with the music industry. And frustrated because I was before my time. You know, I was the one wearing the crazy haircuts, shaving off my sides and ponytail in the middle and white wigs and all kind of stuff. And they were like, you def- you doing too much. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you doing too much. Now they and, tell you you weren't doing enough. Yeah. And, and... It was a little too much that they didn't understand. You know, they didn't understand that. That's like what. And and um, Andre Harrell wanted me to be this 
whole thing that he made marry before Mary. And he came to me with the whole idea of the queen of hip hop soul, the queen of the ghetto, all kinds of stuff. I was like, I said, yo, dude, I don't want to be no queen of no ghetto. I'm not. I don't do shrimp earrings. I don't do all of that. So what you talking about? And he was like, you, just, you know, you're not. No, I was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and do I regret saying no, I wouldn't do it? Nope. Because I think that Mary, that was for Mary. It wasn't for Jackie. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it, it was, you know, what it was. And, and um, I'm, I'm glad that Mary got to, you know, become that because, and not because she fit the description of it, which, you know, she, she had it down. From the beginning, because that she she was from New York, you know, mm. she was from the brick, knowing about it. See, I moved down south, so I couldn't relate. I was in the, you know, I grew up in the mountains with my grandfather growing our food. <laughs> we picking string beans and corn and everything else, and that's we ate that. So me saying I was a, a you know, a ghetto girl and, a, and the shrimp earrings, that wasn't me. I couldn't lie and be like, that was me. Right. Now I could bring it. You know, I was like, yeah, you want to, you want the thug? I could bring that, you know, but I couldn't bring the whole, you know, I wouldn't have had the story for it. Right. So I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. But then I got um, pregnant with my second son and my second son was three me. And that's after I did the Family Stand record. And uh, Family Stand had some issues with um, Sylvia Rohn, and I have nothing to do with it. You know, Sylvia's my girl. So I still love her to this day. And uh, the record got pulled. We were going to do a European tour, and the record got pulled. But, you know, we had the single off of it and video and all of that. But it was what it was. And um, once I had my son and I had to... He was premature. I had to um, stop. That gave me a, a, an excuse to stop singing, really, like, you know, because I wanted to focus on the kids, on, on the boys. And my son needed therapy. He needed speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. So I was like, you know, let me just do this. So what I did was I started doing jingles for television. Okay. And... um that worked for a minute, you know, and and then I couldn't do that anymore because my son needed more therapy than I thought. So it was like, okay, you can't even go through no jingles. You got to make sure that he's getting what he needs. And I had to stop. And then what, it was like once I stopped, my whole everything died in me, you know, my whole thing to sing and everything it just it just left mm -hmm. and I didn't want to do it anymore because I was scared to do it after you're not doing it for a while then it's like okay how do I come back you know how do I do this how do I put myself back into it so I ran I ran from it and so you just now, had no desire at all to perform like even singing in church I was singing, and I, I had joined the choir, and I was uh, rehearsing with them. <laughs> but I never, I never sung, sung, you know, again in church and stuff because the one thing for me, my, you know, my grandmother was a Pentecostal minister, and um, I'm all about God, and I'm not. Uh, I don't believe in the whole because you couldn't sing R and B, you go sing gospel. Even though I love gospel music. Okay. And I think that a lot of singers do that. Like, oh, let me go sing. But there's some singers that really, really need to be singing in church and not singing R and B. <laughs> right. Because they just blow singing. You know, they got that anointing on their voice. You know, it's like. You need to feel the Holy Spirit coming out your pores when they sing. So it's just like some people just have that. Like that's what that's what Fantasia does for me. You know what? When you said it, that's what I was thinking of. 
oh God, she just, oh, she just, she just make me feel mm -hmm. like, you know, her anointing is bananas on her. Just her vocals for, for that. Everybody don't have that. And, and then when they do R and B, it's like, you okay in doing R and B, but you really need to be, you know. <clears throat> it's the same thing I felt for Kelly Price and um even even Dave Hollister. I used to tell Dave all the time, You got calling on your life, boy. And that's my boy. I was like, You got calling on your life, boy, stop playing with God. <laughs> so you know, I just felt like that wasn't for me to go run and and try to go sing in gospel because, you know, God didn't make me for that either. Not to say that he didn't make me for singing gospel because I'll sing praises to God any day, all day. Mm. But at the end of the day, I know he has um, something for me. And I, um, I tried to get back into it about nine years ago. I was like, okay, you know what, I'm going to go sing. And I did um, Sweat Hotel thing with Keys. And right. I was singing with Bobby. I was saying with Bobby Brown, because Bobby's my boy, you know, because um, we all had, Hiram Hitch was my manager. Okay. And he had BBD and, you know, um, New Edition. And Bobby was, you know, Bobby's my family. And uh, I was singing with him for a minute. And then I, I stopped that and I just stopped singing again. And then I woke my yellow behind up last year because you know god put on my spirit and looked at me like i had 10 heads and said really because i'll let you get old and you won't you be broke up <laughs> <laughs> and he was like and i'll let you i'm definitely gonna let you be poor mm. and i realized that you know i was running from something that he gifted me with and he wanted to use me for whatever not necessarily to be no star I'm not trying to make you no know, comeback or anything, you know, to be like a Beyonce or anything. I'm too old for that. I, my thing is to do great music, but at the same time, be able to touch people all over the place, you know, um, because I, I've got, I had gotten to the place where I was, you know, really almost homeless. Mm -hmm. um, thank God I didn't have to be homeless. I was over my head. And everything, but you know, God had to allow me to see that. He had to let He had to let me get to that. Like I will take and pull everything from you until you do what I said. I gave you that, you know. And so now, um, you know, I've been doing little stuff. I have a song out, um, a remix on this house record that I did overseas for overseas, and it's actually doing pretty good, pretty pretty well. And I don't know about the house music that much, but. You know, I was um, I was talking to um, Freedom Williams. You know that you know Freedom Williams, and we were texting, and he was like, "That song is bananas." <laughs> I'm saying, you know the song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he know all about the house. Oh yeah, well, see, I don't see know nothing about it. Mm. He was like, "That song is bananas." I want to, I want to burn on it. I want to, I want to. What are you talking about? So, like, I, I had no idea. And um, it just, you know, it's out and it's doing well. And I'm like, okay, you know, thank you, God, for, for everything, you know, everything that you do. But I had to realize that, you know, people take and make like God is supposed to throw all these things out the sky. He don't do that. He don't work that way. We know that. He don't work that way. He ain't sending no checks in the mail. And none of that, because you didn't gave up your rent money trying to put it in the, in the um, tray. He ain't doing none of that. That's funny. I saw a meme. <laughs> I saw a meme on Facebook this week that said, uh, "You know how they're always sending out the like this and tomorrow they put money in your mailbox." And it said right. it was a picture of a fifty dollar bill, and it said, if, "Like this and tomorrow you'll still wake up broke." That's right. <laughs> I had to like that when it's sent it around. Because it's the truth. Right. It's true. You know, the the sad part is, no, God did not make us to be poor at all. You know, it being, all of that stuff is all a mindset, and it's a mindset of, you know, the enemy to keep people down, 
and to believe in that. And as long as we as black people are spending our money mm -hmm. and spending it stupidly, we'll never have any. As long as we taking our money and we go into the stores and we, you know, we feel like we got to have the dopest stroller, you know, the dopest this and the dopest that, but we live in the projects, we still have a, a, a poor man's mentality. And that's what keeps us where we are. You be broke doing everything backwards instead of, you know, the one thing that I had to realize is from reading, because I've been studying for like 10 years now, God has laws. This is the, the planet is ran off of laws. It's run by laws. And it's not laws like, oh, if you don't do this right, you just, you got, you don't do this right. No, it's, if you're not doing by law, you know, faith without works is dead, period. So if you're not doing, there's no results. He can't make three or four, five steps for you if you're not even making one. So, you know, and that's how I see it. I see that people that don't even believe, they still become successful. Why? Because they still are functioning under that law. If I'm not getting too deep, please. You know, <laughs> you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Mm -mm. Come on, no you know <laughs> what? <laughs> that's fine with me. Um, I did have a question for you. Okay, and um, okay. we've talked to some other artists, um, some producers. The music industry has changed, and in a way, it's kind of going back to when you guys were doing it big, where it's not so many huge labels. You can kind of pop up your own boutique and get distributed. What, how has the music industry, as you've seen it, changed from, you know, the days of everybody, and Teddy and Keith, to now? What, what have you seen? that maybe you wouldn't even want to get back into the music business or you would warn somebody away from it? Well, because of social media and, and everything now that we have going on, well, the difference between the, the music industry then from the 90s and now, even from the late 80s, you know, the music industry had money, and they had a lot of money to waste. And you had record stores, you had the Tower Records, you had Virgin Records, you had, you know, you had record stores to go to, then you had the mom and pop stores. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you had the radio stations getting payola and this and this and this and that. It was a whole bunch of crazy, dirty stuff going on, but it worked. It was, it was, it was a um, system. And that system kept money, ge money generating. And once that system was changed, where there was no more CDs, like, you know, to go in a store and buy, you could, I mean, you could still buy CDs, but it was about, it was all about downloading. That started killing everything because that system that they had going on that helped everybody keep money in everybody's pocket and had more money coming in than probably should have been, um, that once that was taken away, that's how the music started to change. Because remember now, R&B, we had our own radio stations that would pump our stuff. And as R&B, we still had a chance to be number one records and, mm -hmm. you know, cross over to pop and do whatever. Once the hip-hop era came like really came in and started twisting itself up with R and B and all of that, then it was like, okay, we we changing the game now. Then where the game really changed was you had the Burbian kids learning how to do what these little black kids already knew how to do before they had in the soul. So once the little suburban kids are figured out how to dance and figured out how to mimic and listen you know, listen to, you know, to, to, to uh, commission or whoever, whoever, whoever in church that they like, <laughs> they study them, because that's what they do. They study them, study their riffs and everything. Now all of a sudden you got these kids that can sing. And mm. I'm not mad at them. And the reason why I'm not mad at them is because they study. And we have it natural, but they studied until they got it down. 
And once, like, the biggest part of it was the computer era, you know, that everything became a download. That killed it for the music industry because then the, the money that was being generated, dirty money or whatever it was that was being generated, mm-hmm. or stopped, came to a halt. So the generation of the, the New Jack Swing era and the good R and the great R and B music from the era that we came out of, you know, with the Teddy Riley's and the and R. Kelly and, you know, Joe doing his thing and you know, we got we had so many big bub in them with mm-hmm. so many groups. I mean, so many great groups, the rule boys, you had Gerald and them, yeah, you, you know, everybody was doing their thing. Everybody was able to tour. We love to go see shows. You don't have any of that anymore. And the new generation is different because everything is, you know, the cell phone and the tablet and the computer and everything that they can, you know, use and download this stuff and do whatever. So now everything is simple. And now you have, you know, Instagram and you got Facebook and you got Twitter. Now it's like ordinary people. Everybody can be a star because <laughs> you got ordinary people getting butt ass naked, <laughs> doing all kinds of stuff, and going on Instagram and um, doing stuff for YouTube, getting all of these hits and getting checks. I didn't even know you could get checks from having like a whole bunch of people on Instagram. <laughs> I was like, you can. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> Yeah, when I found out this week, I thought I had the game backwards. Oh, my God. It's bananas. But what I do see, see, black people, one thing about us, we sell our own stuff. We will murder our own music, our own sayings, our own whatever, and we got to remember that we're the ones that created it. Mm. Now, everything that we have done from the 90s or whatever, now all of a sudden it's old school. Why would you call your music old school? That's not even old school. It's like, that's just a different generation. Mm -hmm. But it's not old school. It's R&B music. And once they took it from being just R&B music to old school, or he's an old head, or whatever, our, our era was probably one of the greatest eras, you know, of this time really right now because that's the era that everybody want to get back to. You don't have the groups like New Edition and and Boys to Men and uh, Next and, you know, all these little groups, um, 112, all of the, you know, you don't have that anymore. And, you know, we don't have the Joes that, I mean, Joes still out and I'm not trying to, Joe is old or nothing because Joe still sound great. Joe can still sell a whole bunch of records. But the thing is, okay, we can we can do these records now. Now you got to take these records to Urban Adult Radio. Well, how much airplay are you going to get at Urban Adult Radio? So that becomes the problem because then you don't have anybody to take the urban the, the urban records and cross them over anymore. Because like I said, the little white kids are studying the black. Black people so much, they already know. They riffing. They know what to do. <laughs> they riffing and they get they pop on, dancing, doing all kinds of stuff. And I can't be mad at them. Right. You can't be mad at them. So, I mean, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> <But, laughs> no, that was a perfect answer. Okay. Now, I heard you're doing a little bit of um, stage and in, immediate. In Oh, the little, the short film mm-hmm. that was posted. Yeah, the the crazy part about that, that was, that was a godsend too, because that was just kind of, it just kind of fell in my lap. Um, my, my girlfriend's best friend, which she's also a friend of mine, I've been knowing her forever, her son, who I've been knowing since he was a baby born, he has a, a company with another guy and a girl, um, all, all of them are brilliant in their own way, you know, with each thing that they do. Um, he he was over to the house, and he was like, 
I got you be perfect in two seconds. We thought he was playing. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't think he was serious. And he um he sent me the script. And I got the script. And I read it and I was like, Okay, and you know, I'm still not paying any attention to it. Like, okay. And then he sends it, you know, he's like, Okay, we shooting Labor Day weekend. And I'm like, huh? What's talking about? I didn't say no lies, <laughs> you know. And then I get to the shoot, and I didn't even know that the character that I'm playing and the character that Mark John Jeffries is playing was, you know, the, the little young boy that I'm going to be talking to, talking to my, you know, talking to him about going to college and the niggas on the street. And I didn't even know it was Mark John Jeffries. You know, from they played Little C's and they played um, Little Isaiah from Saving Isaiah. But when I'm sitting, looking, you know, we waiting to shoot. I um, I'm looking and I'm like, why well, I don't know that little boy. <laughs> 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 I'm saying I know that little boy facing somewhere, and you know, everybody's a little boy to me because I'm be 49 next week. So I'm still looking like I know this 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 kid, and um, they were like, oh, that's that's, you know. The kid that played with the scenes and so I said, oh, that's where I know him from. But the crazy thing that is so brilliant about doing this short film is the people that I did it with, that little crew, oh, my God, when when they really get on with their, you know, get the right funding behind their, their film company, they're going to be really, really big because – their ideas and their their um their directing everything they were so professional they were so um just on it every which way and it's a it's a um one of the guys the director his name is boom he's a beast he is a beast and when I tell you just all of them working together you have Stanley um Davis and then you have the other girl um Brittany. I can't think of Brittany's last name, but they are phenomenal together. They just make such a great team. And just the, the pulling favors and the stuff that they do. They did a thing with Michelle Obama and um, with some other people did like a commercial thing. And it was it was phenomenal. And it's just the, little, the work that they're doing, it's quality work. And for me, I was honored to do it because I'm like, you know, I had no idea, but you don't know what God has for you, mm -hmm. you know. And right before that, um, a friend of mine was telling me, oh, you know what, I want you to audition for the NBC version of The Wiz playing this one. But my package wasn't together, so I wasn't able to do it. Um, but I don't mind, you know, trying my little thing at acting. I'm definitely trying to, you know, get 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 into that, you know. Without, like I said, whatever God has for me. If he say model something, I'm modeling it. If he say saying something, I'm going to say. <laughs> if he say act and do that, I'm doing it. <laughs> as long as it falls in your face, you know that's for you. So we have um, that. I don't know. I know that's going to the, the – um, Sundance Film Festival. Okay. I don't know when that is coming out, but it's called The Wrong Bodega, and it's a short film by um, Charge Film. Um, that's the company, and like I said, they're brilliant. They're a br brilliant group of people working together, that, and they're black, and, you know, they're very blessed. They're very blessed kids. And, um, I think they have something. I think they have something really great, and it's going to be big. So have you caught the acting book? Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, just don't let them give me nothing. Don't let me start doing stuff and they give me too many lines, because I'm going to miss that boat. Because I'm like, I got to remember. Well, now, I you, you know that leads us to Empire, right? Oh, God. You don't know what I think about it? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> no, you know what? For Empire, I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. For Empire, we know good and well that there's no record label on this planet that's like that. Right. <laughs> that is so, so way, way, way less. But 
the part that I love about it is the 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 way that they have that this black woman and this black man the black woman goes to jail for 17 years and this black man takes his drug money and he builds up this whole empire, you know, this whole big record label besides being a record label, being, you know, um, a business, period. The thing that I don't like about it, um, I don't like the fact, and, and I can't, I'm not going to hold my tongue on this. I'm not going to be unfair. Um, I'm not for them putting all that sexuality in it. So because of that, um, I don't watch it as much as I did. Because once they start putting all the extra stuff there, I'm like, okay, that's too much. Now you're doing too much. You start messing with the kids, and I'm, I'm, I don't play when it comes to kids. And I don't care who don't like what the hell I say. Mm. I love everybody. But at the end of the day, what you do is not everybody's business. What you do in your private life and in your bedroom. And I think that they're promoting a lot of promiscuity and all of that. And, and that's not cool for these kids. And I think that's why, you know, I think God has a call. No. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely have a call for me because, you know, I'm not, I ain't one to die. I ain't scared of nobody. Right. And I ain't backing down to nobody. And we're not doing that. Your life is your life. So, I mean, I just think it's too, too, too much with certain things, you know. Understood. So. Well, let me just tell you, I have enjoyed this conversation. Probably the most enjoyable conversation I've had um, in a while. I'm and, sorry, thank you. Yeah, I really am. Um, thank oh, you. thank you. Thank you. We'd love for you to be a friend of Brownstone. Check back in with you from time to time. We always. Oh, wait. Come on now. Yeah, we're on. You're going to call my phone now. You family. <laughs> <laughs>